All right. Well, welcome, everyone, as you're finding your seats. Welcome to friends, colleagues, students, alumni, guests from near and far. We're glad to have you all joining us here this morning uh, for our sessions. And um, I'm Laura Yoder. I direct the Human Needs and Global Resources Program, which is now in its 43rd year at Wheaton College. We're so glad you're here for these days of celebration with us in this symposium, uh, which is sponsored by the John Deere Foundation. Several years ago, the idea, the germ of an idea for the symposium on the theme of radical discipleship, loving Jesus in all of life, came to us from reading what friends of John Stott wrote about him. It was striking how many talked about specific actions and interactions with him that were formative in their own lives. For someone best known worldwide as an evangelist, a preacher, and a writer, those closest to Stott, when speaking about him, focused on his lived out commitments as much as his words. Many emphasized the remarkable, simple integrity of his life, of his teaching that matched his lifestyle. His commitment to following Jesus was clear and evident in his life. And this led him to found and to join organizations that had outward orientations to impacting the world in many sectors with the holistic good news. And his legacy lives on through these institutions, some of which we're featuring here. So for a small taste of uh, what it is to speak about this among friends, we've gathered here for these days a group of speakers whose relationships with Stott and his many associated institutions span various times and forms. Many convictions evident in John Stott's ministry are mirrored in the Human Needs and Global Resources Program. Stott distinctively held together his sharing of the good news of Jesus Christ through biblical teaching and preaching with his understanding that social action is integral to the life of discipleship. These convictions deepened over the course of his life and ministry, especially as he befriended people in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and in his home of London, who had backgrounds very different from his own of high status and privilege. And as we heard last night from Dr. Mark Laberton, Stott's convictions were anchored in his awareness of the fully transformative reality of the Lordship of Christ over all creation and in every aspect of a Christian's life, of his own life. Notably, Stott's commitments extended to substantial and long-standing involvement in multiple institutions that reflected his understanding of integral mission and for which his theological contributions were formative. This symposium highlights three of these institutions that exemplify this involvement and we're delighted to have representatives from each involved in speaking and leading workshops together. First, the Langham Partnership, founded by Stott in 1969, grew out of his profound commitment to supporting global church leadership by developing resources and supporting theological education and biblical training for pastors. From Langham, the Reverend Dr. Chris Wright, whom John Stott named to carry on this ministry, will speak in chapel today, just uh, after this session, and again here tonight at 7 p.m. Second, since 1968, Tear Fund has joined Compassion with Practical Action, serving as a leading evangelical voice in Christian social engagement. Tear Fund equips and mobilizes local churches to support communities working to overcome poverty, violence, and disasters. Many people don't know that John Stott served as Tear Fund president from 1983 to 1997. And tomorrow morning, Jason Faleda of Tear Fund USA will lead us into workshops of what this looks like in various facets in the lives of women and men engaged in whole life discipleship. And third, Arasha engages and equips Christians in 20 countries to deepen their connection to God through the active care of creation. Stott served on Arasha's council of reference from their 1983 founding to the end of his life and he informed and inspired their theological framework very closely. Tomorrow's workshop focuses on creation care and worship. Since 2013, the John Stott Endowment has enabled the Human Needs and Global Resources Program to broaden its impact on and off campus by supporting new initiatives. These include inviting international leaders for significant, sustained interactions with the campus and our surrounding community. 
supporting extended faculty engagement with critical human needs, funding faculty research worldwide on central program themes and student scholarships. Throughout these days, you will glimpse some of the first new fruits that this gift has contributed to our campus. At least four of our nine international visiting scholar, artist, practitioners to date are here with us. These are the scholar practitioners invited by a department to spend one to four months here pursuing their own projects while engaging fully in campus life. Faculty who have taken the study research leave are involved in hosting our sessions. And we will witness two artistic outcomes of the new faculty grants for research and creative projects. One will be this afternoon at 2.30 with two arrangements of spirituals by Sean O'Peblo from the conservatory performed for the first time at Wheaton. The other is the Blood and Milk Media Exhibition about victim offender reconciliation in post-genocide Rwanda, which is now open in Adams Hall by Junhee Park of Communication, which will be used in the Reconciliation Center of the Rwandan organization CARSA. So don't miss seeing that in Adams during your time here. The endowed chair being inaugurated later today is another component of this gift and it is quite an honor to celebrate this here with you today. I'm especially delighted to celebrate with my dear office colleagues and want to acknowledge their exceptional work down to the last detail of this event. So thank you to our symposium czar, Jamie Huff, Laura Atkinson, Mandy Kellams Baraka, and Alex Jones, who made this all happen. So let's thank them together. Our anchoring verses for this symposium are from John 14, 21 and 23, which were among Stott's favorite verses. Hear Jesus' words. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Please pray with me. Lord, we are so grateful for the gift of this day. Thank you for each person in the audience and up front who is present to listen and learn. Soften our hearts and give us open ears and eyes to receive from you today. Amen. I'd like to introduce now our first two speakers. Each will speak, and then their discussant, Dr. Nadim Roram, professor of biology, will join them on stage for a time of questions and answers. Our second speaker will be Kuki Rokum. She's the Director of Training and Mobilization for EFICOR, the Evangelical Fellowship of India Commission on Relief. EFICOR works to prepare communities and respond to disasters nationwide, and their staff of several hundred work throughout the country as uh, disasters occur. She addresses injustice by working directly with people who are poor and marginalized. She studied at All Nations Christian College and completed a course taught by John Stott at the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity, and her home state is in Northeast India, Mizoram. Our first speaker is Dr. Ruth Padilla de Borst. She's a theologian, missiologist, educator, and storyteller. She has been involved in leadership development and theological education for integral mission in her native Latin America for several decades. She lives in an intentional Christian community with deep concern for right living in relation to the whole of creation. She's a leader of missional, she's the leader of missional leadership with Resonate Global Mission and works with the Community of Interdisciplinary Theological Studies, or SETI, with more than 1,000 students across Latin America she also coordinates the networking team of Infimit, the International Fellowship for Mission as Transformation, among many other things. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ruth Padilla Divorced. Buenos dias. He was addicted. He confessed. I am addicted to the observation of wildlife in general and birds in particular. 
about his visit to the Galapagos Islands where he studied and photographed iguanas, tortoises, albatross, frigate birds, and many other animals, he wrote, I had an orgy of photography. Undoubtedly, if he were alive today, he would be grieving deeply for the three billion birds that have disappeared in the last 50 years in North America and at the tragic news about accelerated global warming. Meet John Stott, or Tio Juan as we knew him in Latin America. John taught us to look, to see the beauty of creation, to see through the eyes of others, to listen, to hear the song of birds, to listen to the word of God and to what was going on in the world. Now, this talk does not intend to promote addictions or orgies, <laughs> unless they are of the sort that Stott embodied. Instead, it invites us to explore the interconnectedness of creation, to acknowledge our need for interdependence in the global church, and to take steps towards mutual accountability within this web of life, intertwining roots for just conviviality. First, as a true Latin American, as usual, I have to bring you greetings. Greetings from your sisters and brothers in Casa Adobe, the intentional Christian community in Costa Rica, where my husband and I and an unlikely assortment of people from many different countries share life, are seeking to live in right relations with one another, with our human neighbors, and with the rest of creation. And greetings from SETI, the Community of Interdisciplinary Theological Studies, which is a learning community that seeks to nourish radical discipleship across Latin America. Next, a word about the metaphor that permeates this entire talk. Do you recognize these trees? Giant redwood trees can grow for a thousand years to enormous heights, and one would expect that each particular tree would have very strong, deep roots to support that size. However, the roots of individual trees are surprisingly small. These impressive trees can stand and grow thanks to the fact that their roots are intertwined in an intimate network that sustains and nourishes them all. The trees nearer the river send nutrients through their roots to the trees further up. They function as a living, mutually sustaining community. I suggest that in a world bent on limitless and unsustainable economic growth with all its ecological fallouts, in a world in which leaders and churches are also enticed to grow unsustainably, pursuing status, wealth, and image, and leaving many excluded people behind, the challenge that faces followers all around the world is to set aside those enticements and instead allow God's spirit to weave us into a community of intertwined roots of radical discipleship as citizens of God's kingdom and promoters of just conviviality. Now, where are we today? October 2019. Media waves are swirling more and more and more species are becoming extinct. The world is getting hotter even faster than predicted, generating more intense hurricanes, longer droughts, and record-breaking heat. Entire populations are being forced to migrate for lack of sustenance. It's ever more impossible to deny the impact of human activity on the planet. And this has led ours to be termed the Anthropocene era one in which human beings are a major geological force negatively affecting all the planetary systems. You might have known two weeks ago there was a climate summit in New York and it revealed that in spite of massive protests, the courageous denunciation of Greta Thunberg, relatively few state and business leaders appear to be listening let alone to be ready to change policies and practices that are exacerbating the crisis. Indigenous peoples, so often judged as primitive, have been sounding the alarm for decades regarding the layers of death sown by developed nations on the non-human life system. Many of their vocal leaders have been murdered, 
and still very few listen. With few exceptions, evangelical leaders tend to see these matters in this country as political and consequently unrelated to the calling of Christians in the world. What way forward, we painfully ask. If not complicit denial or hopeless resignation, what is our role as followers of Jesus in this scenario? Time only allows for a couple signposts inspired by the life and ministry of John Stott that can help us forge a way forward as members of the creation community and radical followers of the Lord of life. First, we need to learn to see so that we might acknowledge how intertwined we are within the biotic community. I looked towards where he pointed, but all I could see was a sandy desert and scraggly dry bushes. I was about to turn away when something suddenly moved and caught my eye. The armadillo scuttled off hurriedly as my siblings and I oohed and awed. Tio Juan smiled. You see, during those days when we camped together in the Argentine Patagonia, John Stott taught us to look. To look up and admire birds in flight, but also to look down and appreciate less dramatic, small things, creatures peeking out from their hideouts in unexpected places at least expected times. Through his example and mild prodding, he taught us to see and appreciate what otherwise would have been non-existent to us. His book, The Birds Are Teachers, Essays in Orny Theology, records the lessons he learned from birds through patient, loving observation about life, joy, trust, perseverance, faith. Now, we may not be avid bird watchers, and we may be so blinded by our ever-lit screens to realize how intricately we are tied to the rest of creation and even to the birds Tio Juan so loved. But with each bird that disappears, a thread is pulled out of the delicate weaving of life. Birds not only enliven the, word, the world with their song and color, they also consume harmful insects and weeds that threaten crops. Without them, the plagues would knock out the agriculture we depend on for our sustenance. Many animals, including humans, live off birds, and plants depend on them for pollination. Leonardo Boff, the Brazilian theologian, says, everything that exists, coexists, subsists by means of, of an infinite web of all-inclusive relations. As thread after thread is yanked out, life itself unravels. Seeing leads us to acknowledge that we all need one another in this delicate balance of life. Second, we need to learn to listen. Listen to one another and to the groaning of creation. Expectant waiting, patient searching, and respectful engagement marked John Stott's posture, not only when listening to his teachers, the birds, and to the wonders of God's creation, but also when relating to sisters and brothers of the church outside the powerful nations of his day. This posture allowed him to tune in and appreciate unexpected contributions from unexpected places. Hardly might one expect in our classist and racist world order that a Cambridge-educated British clergyman might have much to learn from people outside the UK. Yet John's was the humble posture of the lifelong learner. He allowed his reading of scripture and his theological articulations to be colored by his friendship with Christians from Africa and Latin America and the realities of their contexts. His friendship with my family began in the early 60s. I was just, I was a couple years old. And it grew through his several visits to Latin America where along with my dad, he taught preaching seminars and explored several ecosystems. That was a condition for his travel. Although he gave my father a nice pair of binoculars, I'm afraid he did not succeed in converting him to his addiction of bird watching. Yet Renee's appreciation for creation was expanded through John's enthusiasm, and he too became a vocal articulator of creation care as an integral part of the mission of Christians in the world. Meanwhile, 
and along the two-way street stretched by the spirit between them, John's vision of mission was expanded to become more holistic as he listened to his friends from around the world and looked at it through their eyes. In Christian Mission in the Modern World, he explained how he had come to realize that Christians are sent as Jesus was into the world, not merely to preach and teach, but to express the gospel in all areas of life. Significant in that broadening understanding of mission were his experiences with Christian leaders who were seeking to follow Jesus faithfully in contexts of poverty, dictatorships, and violence. So when the evangelical credentials of those leaders were questioned by the evangelical establishment of the North Atlantic in global fora like Lausanne One, Stott stood firmly by their side. One cannot suspect, cannot but suspect, that without his active advocacy, Billy Graham's words when looking back on the Lausanne Congress might never have been uttered. And here I quote Billy Graham. If one thing has, be, has come through loud and clear, it is that we evangelicals should have social concern. The discussion in smaller groups about the contemporary meaning of radical discipleship has caught fire, end quote. Humble listening had enabled Stott to mediate between sectors and allow the gifts of the global church to be brought to the common table for mutual learning and more faithful learning. Insightful looking and respectful listening, two sensory and spiritual gifts so lacking in our fast-paced world, bent as it is towards exploitation and rapid gain, both are essential and urgent practices if we are to correct our trajectory as humanity in our common home. Volverán las golondrinas? Will the swallows return to Central America? That question serves as the title of a book published in Costa Rica over 40 years ago by Swedish Ecuadorian ecologist Ingemar Hedstrom. The study released three weeks ago indicates that these evocative birds, whose astounding memory allows them to find the very nest in which they crack their shell at birth, even if it's 6,000 miles away and only returned to in their next migration, are severely endangered. Many of them count prominently among those three billion birds that have disappeared over the last decades, due mostly to pesticides and global warming. Will the swallows return? The answer is no. They will not return unless we take off our consumerist glasses through which we see a dollar sign on everything and everyone and instead use binoculars that expose the dark shadow of deadly greed under the varnish of progress and prosperity. They will not return unless we listen to the communities already being affected by sea rise, desertification, and ocean pollution. They will not return unless we hear the groans of the land gouged open for the extraction of the black gold it has taken millennia to produce and work together to create alternative sources of energy. They will not return unless as Christians we go back to scripture and allow God's spirit to read us into the story of a good creation and a renewed earth and we hear afresh our original calling to care for the garden in which God planted us. They will not return unless we quiet our hearts enough to hear the still, small voice of God's spirit pleading, choose life. And join with like-hearted children, women, and men, not as messiahs, but as humble followers of a humble Lord to live the whole gospel and make daily choices of care within the creation community. Now these are lessons we're learning a day at a time at Casa Adobe. Three final stories illustrate how recognizing ourselves as part of a global body with intertwined roots can nourish our hopeful commitment and enable us to live more justly as part of that community. 
For Lent last year, we determined to get truly seri serious about reducing single-use plastic. We began trying out alternatives, cloth bags, solid containers, making our own toothpaste, and so on. One day, as we were running out of steam, I noticed that Ruth Valerio from Tear Fund had begun a Facebook group titled Plastic Less Living. Tuning in with the questions and experiments of sisters and brothers across the ocean gave us fresh ideas and much encouragement. We were not alone in our effort. Instead, our modest attempts could inspire others, and many small initiatives could add up and bring some needed change. In a similar vein, early this year, headed up by Erika Alvarez, Casa Adobe began ex organizing the neighborhood, our neighborhood, to recognize our relationship with the river that runs a scarce 400 meters from our home. Today, it is classed as the most polluted river in Central America. Yet our 40-year-old neighbors remember family picnics and swimming in it. A young South African volunteer has designed an artistic rendition, and neighbors have written songs and poetry about the river. All these initiatives, along with regular visits to the sites and cleanup days, are allowing our neighbors to regain the relationship with the Bidija and to make concrete commitments like no longer dumping trash down the side of the hill. As their re that relationship is healed, so are relationships within the community, the human community. People who barely nodded to one another in passing are now joined by the care of their shared place. Finally, a confession. We began noticing some stray bees around the one of the corners of our house, and we initially tried to shoo them away. But as days wore on, we began hearing an increasingly louder buzz. We called a local bee beekeeper keeper, who offered to take care of the situation for free in exchange for the bees. Imagine our surprise when he removed the floorboards from the second story and uncovered a huge beehive complete with a couple pints of honey. As he looked at the grounds and gardens at Casadove, and although he could have profited by taking them, he said, I won't take the bees. This is a good home for them. So he helped us set up a proper space for them and has visited them and us a few times to coach our garden team about their care. All this sure challenged us to be far better listeners to the non-human community of which we are a part. Will the swallows return? We cannot avoid. Hmm. Whoops. Some slides got left along the way. So let's just go here. Let's see. Or just leave it there. Um, will the swallows return? We cannot avoid the question if we seek to fulfill our creational mandate. To what and to whom are we listening? What do we need to see? Who do we need to see? Will the swallows return? It will be an uphill battle. The answer ultimately depends on our openness to God's spirit, who yearns to weave us into a story much larger than our individual ones so that we may recognize ourselves as members of a living system of intertwined roots that nourishes and requires radical followership of Jesus. May we have eyes to see and ears to hear. Thank you. And Cookie will join us now. Thank you so much, Ruth. This morning, I want to share my story and my journey. It is not a spectacular story or journey, but it is one in which I have learned what it means to love our neighbors in God's world. In 1997, as a young, feisty volunteer working in a church in West London, I attended the Christian in the Modern World course at the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity. It was a Wednesday evening special, and there was John Stott beaming photographs of the snowy owl 
onto an old you know, style slide projector. You know the one that goes click, click? Many of these students don't know what that is here. <laughs> There's music on cassette tape and him narrating his quest to see the snowy owl. It was an amazing presentation, but at that time, I did not grasp his excitement at seeing and capturing the photos of the snowy owl. 22 years on, having grown in my faith and understanding of God, I realized that it was not just a hobby fulfilled for John Stott, but it revealed his deep concern for God's world and how we are to live as disciples of Christ. My faith journey and my understanding of God has challenged me to think about what it means to live as God's people in God's world. And this morning I want to say that there are two factors that demand urgent reflection and response from the global church. The first is how we understand God's relationship to the world. And the second is how we understand the command to love our neighbor. So before I go on, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I come from a small state tucked away in Northeast India called Mizoram. It was evangelized by Welsh missionaries in the 1800s and a classic case of mass evangelism where whole villages turned to Christ. And although I did not grow up in my home state, but we had very much of the Mizo culture, Sunday school, memory verses, daily family devotions, choir, vacation Bible school. You know, I'm sure many of you identify with that. Our soul and doing good was of prime importance. But I also distinctly remember my father's compassion for animals and for the rest of creation. And I come from India, where we live a very sustainable life, lifestyle. You know, every item in the house while I was growing up was reused. No one had to teach us to reuse plastic bags or bottles. They were just reused. And our waste, like paper and other waste, was, was and is still bought by what, whom we call rag merchants, or in Hindi, they're called kabariwalas. And Things like, um, you know, um, uh, we, uh, waste in terms of food or any form of waste was frowned upon. You shall not waste, you know, anything. And maybe that is why I feel we did not receive any specific training on creation care. But in spite of that, all the churches, not only in my home state of Mizoram, but in India, focused on verbal proclamation and being born again. Very much like maybe some of how you grew up. My first exposure to any form of biblical teaching was at the London Institute. We were taught to read the Bible in the context and then how we are to understand it in our context. And I remember John Stott teaching on double listening, listening to the word and listening to the world was highly inspirational and it was reflected in where LICC was located, right in the heart of London. It wasn't tucked away in some nice country cottage where you learned stuff and then came out to the world to engage with the world. It was right in the heart of the city. And as we came out, I know after every session, every evening we came out, we had to walk past homeless people and drunken people, and of course the hundreds of shoppers on Oxford Street. We were in the world. And when I was there, my faith started opening up from this navel-gazing relationship between God and me. At that same time, I was also living and working at St. George's Church in South Hall with Reverend Dave Bookless and his family. And this was the beginning of Arosha in UK. Arosha is a Christian organization engaging in conservation. And they were starting up this fascinating project of turning toxic wasteland into, into a land that would flourish again. I found it fascinating, fascinated by the theology and what they were doing. They felt to me a little bit like a bunch of crazy people. You know, I didn't quite understand what they were doing, but it fascinated me. And I thought it was amazing, but I didn't fully grasp at that time why they were doing what they were doing. And a few years later, I was at All Nations Christian College, where Chris Wright, who was here, was the principal. And we had a course on what was called theology of mission. 
and environmental organizations, Christian organizations, were introduced to us as one form of mission. And I was intrigued. Hmm, is caring for creation just one form of mission? Or are we all called to care for creation? Isn't that very much part of our faith? All of these experiences reveal to me that God was so much bigger than the God of my Sunday school. And I begin to understand a greater understanding of God's plan and purpose for the world, which included all of creation. And I was beginning to grasp what it meant to image God. And my understanding of this God became bigger. It continued to grow as I worked in India with the Evangelical Fellowship of India Commission on Relief. And I want to tell you a bit about that because it started in 1967 by the Evangelical Fellowship of India as a response to drought that happened in the eastern state of Bihar in India. There was, uh, there was a drought which resulted in famine and people were dying. In 1967, EFI took a momentous decision to decide to respond to the famine in spite of the fact that EFI's mandate was church growth. EFICOR then became a relief and development organization and in 1979, it realized that the key element in responding to the needs of the world is educating and equipping the church. If we want to bring change, we need to educate and equip the church, and therefore the training department was opened, which I'm a part of at the moment. EFICOR also was engaged in what was called the MICA network then, a network of evangelical Christians involved in issues of justice. And Ethical's passion was and is to move away from the dichotomous understanding of mission, which John Stott clearly voiced in the Lausanne Covenant of 1974. And Micah Network in 2001 started using the term integral mission. Rene Padilla, Ruth's dad, was one of those people who were very instrumental in that, from in the Micah Declaration of 2001. And as we grappled to have a more integral understanding of mission, there was increasing unpredictability in weather events and more natural disasters. And we also started coming face to face with this term called climate change in the early 2000s. We were unsure of what it meant, didn't quite grasp what it was, but the impacts were being felt, especially amongst impoverished communities we work with. And so we could no longer remain silent. And so the MICA network in 2009 came with a declaration on creation stewardship and climate change. Soon after, we had the Lausanne uh, meeting in Cape Town, and the Lausanne Cape Town commitment of 2010 clearly stated that creation care is a gospel issue under the Lordship of Christ. The Jamaica Call to Action of 2012 built on this commitment, confirming the importance and urgency of the matter creation care was becoming more important. You know, I was part of the MICA Declaration, writing the MICA Declaration, and also to some extent in the Jamaica Call to Action. And I was there in, in Cape Town for the Lausanne Gathering. And in all of these experiences, what I learned was it, it became more and more obvious that contribution of people from all over the world and the voices of people from all over the world needs to be heard. A deeper understanding of God, his mission, and how we are to live as disciples of Christ is not just to be found in the halls of learning, but also through the lived experiences and voices of peoples from around the world. So it has been great to see all these changes happening in our thinking and our theology of mission. Stewardship of the, of the environment has become more important. But let's pause for a moment. Why do we still have so many problems around the world? And why do we still not see this creation stewardship as crucial and important? And I would like to say that there are two things. There are two root causes. One is a lack of understanding of who owns the earth 
And second is a selective understanding and interpretation of what it means to love our neighbor. So whose earth is this? Psalm 24, one, we all know that, declares the earth is the Lord's and all who dwell in it. You know, we, in, in, in my experience as a trainer in India, I know that everyone accepts God as creator. In fact, it is common amongst many religious groups as well. God is creator. And in India, we don't have a problem about dominion and ruling over. It is not taken as an excuse to use and abuse the environment. But what many of us don't realize is who owns the earth? Because ownership matters. You know, if we read the account of, of creation, Genesis 1, it's clear that God delighted in his creation. He created human beings as image bearers to care for what he had created. And being made in God's image is a job description given to humanity of servant kingship, of ruling and managing the rest of, of creation in a way that reflects God's character. Our relationship with the rest of creation is very relational as well. Adam was given the task to name creatures, which is such an amazing job. Now, before the fall, the earth was sacred ground in which God dwelt with his people. Now, the earth or land is a commodity. You know, we put up fences. This is my property. We exploit it. And as roots, we gouge it for our own profit and our needs. You know, in many communities in India, there is, there are called sac uh, we have what are called sacred groves, which are communally protected lands. And many areas in India are dotted with these sacred groves. And these sacred groves are protected because of fear of the deity. Nothing is taken out of these groves because it's sac it is sacred and it will, it will anger the deity. It's one of the most excellent form of conservation. The air is cleaner, the water is so much cleaner, and all manner of creatures live in it. I have seen one myself in Meghalaya. These sacred groves are protected as a response of fear of the deity. And sometimes I wonder what a difference it would make if we as Christians acknowledge who the earth belonged to not an expression of fear, but of faith, and tend and care for the rest of, the cre of creation, because it is our God-given responsibility as the crown of creation. And the problem is this morning is that we are all called to live on this one earth. We need to coexist on this one earth. You know, Jesus' command Jesus' response when he was asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law, was, we all know that, love your neighbor as you, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and the second is like it, like the first one, same, is to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, in Ethico, we've been waiting, working for over 50 years, helping the poor, supporting the poor communities, and recently we worked in anti-human trafficking as well. And sometimes I wonder, why are people trafficked? And one of the simplistic reasons is because they are too poor because their lands have failed to produce what they should produce. It can produce no longer. The crops have failed. And could it be that because we did not care for the earth and because of our greed and, our greed and exploitation have resulted in death and disease? Have some of us used the earth to feed our greed, resulting in others not even getting their basic needs and needing to be trafficked, to be sold, to eat food? The Global Footprint Network declared 29th July 2019 as the Earth Overshoot Day. They measure the capacity of the earth to regenerate what we consume. We consumed our quota for this year in July. And if you take individual countries, according to their data, if we all lived like Americans, we need five Earths to sustain us. If we live like Australians, we need four Earths to sustain us. If you live like an Indian or a Nepali, 0.7 Earths to sustain us. 
And it's not because we're any good, but we're saved by the poor millions in our country. How on God's earth can some consume so much that it would take five earths to support our lifestyle? Loving our neighbor requires that we realize that our consumption patterns impact and harm the neighbors living in the other side of the world. Next, I want to talk about waste. You know, when God created, there was no waste. Everything could be recycled. The, the water that we're drinking this morning, today, has been recycled a million times. Even our own bodies are recyclable. The levels of waste have exploded on this planet with development. But according to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, the world produces 1.4 billion tons of food waste, which could feed as many as 2 billion people each year. What does it mean to love 925 million people in the world who do not have enough to eat? With progress, we've manufactured a lot of items, some that cannot go back to the earth. Our waste is choking God's earth. You know, the landfill in Delhi is as tall as the Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal is an iconic uh, monument in India. 240 feet is how high our landfill is. We are saved by rag pickers in India who risk their lives sorting out waste for us. Recently, we've been bombarded with pictures of islands of plastic floating in the ocean. Ultimately, waste causes death, both human and wildlife. And recently, Tier Fund UK, Fauna and Flora International, Waste Aid and Institute of Development highlighted this in the report, No Time to Waste. And I hope you were able to see that at some point. Who produces this waste and who dies as a result of this? You know, in the West, waste is not visible. I haven't seen any waste in Wheaton. You all conscientiously sort your waste. Unfortunately, a lot of this sorted waste is then shipped to other countries. What cannot be thrown in my backyard is then thrown in someone else's backyard. How do we love our neighbor in this waste-producing life? You know, I've seen interviews of people who are grateful for this waste in our countries. Oh, we got jobs. You know, we earned money. And our children were able to get educated. In short, they were saying, thank you for this waste. Thank you for dumping your waste on us. I'm not sure Jesus would agree with this method of loving our neighbor. Another important issue that we need to acknowledge is the climate emergency. Climate change ravaged nations. I know it is disputed, debated in the US, but we're dying of it. Because in countries like India, there is extreme weather events, changing monsoon patterns, record temperatures. Efico, you know, when, when we interview farmers, I hear the same story. Something has changed. It's not the same. The rain is too much, too little, too early, too late. According to surveys, 45 farmers committed suicide per day in India in the last 10 years. Environmental degradation, misuse of chemical fertilizers have all contributed to this, but climate change has acted as the last nail in the coffin. Climate change is not a matter of debate in India. We live it, we have to adapt to it, and it is a reality we have to wrestle with. The poorest countries, and in them the poorest people who have, not, who have done the least damage, suffer the most. With increased disasters, there's going to be increased displacement. There are going to be more refugees. In this climate of change, how do we respond faithfully to loving our neighbors? You know, by the time we finish arguing about climate change, many more farmers would have committed suicide in desperation. So how do we respond as the people of God? Should we respond out of fear, like those people who are protecting the sacred forests? Or do we respond because I'm scared of what climate change might do, the disasters? The Lausanne Cape Town commitment beautifully 
captures how we are to respond as people of God. Love of God's creation is not mere sentimental affection for nature, which the Bible nowhere commands. Still less is it pantheistic worship of nature, which the Bible expressly forbids. Rather, it is the logical outworking of our love for God by caring for what belongs to him. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The earth is the property of the God we claim to love and obey. We care for the earth most simply because it belongs to the one whom we call Lord. The earth is created, sustained, and redeemed by Christ. We cannot claim to love God by abusing what belongs to Christ by right of creation, redemption, and inheritance. We care for the earth and responsibly, responsibly use its abundant resources, not according to the rationale of the secular world, but for the Lord's sake. The Lausanne Cape Town commitment. Caring for God's world is part of a biblical calling and not an optional extra. Responding to climate change is a big challenge, especially for people like the church in India and for the church in many parts of the global south. But to their credit, people have not wasted time in debating whether it is necessary to be involved or not. Another way that we can respond as people of God is to move away from convenience. Many of us have sacrificed God's world in what I call the altar of convenience. You know, when I was doing this training once, one senior missionary put his hand up and he said, Sister, I accept everything you say. I accept the theology. I understand what is happening to the environment and that it is wrong, that it upsets God, but it is so convenient. So unfortunately, this desire for convenience has been exploited by the capitalist market economy as well. In India, we used to have natural cleansing products for hair, for body, everything was natural. In it, companies came in and packaged in plastic amazing shampoos which had natural ingredients in them. And not only that, they became cleverer in India. They started packaging it in small sachets, which meant that it was more accessible to poor people. And so it was so much convenient, so much more convenient to purchase these products. You know, in church events, we end up with a pile of discarded plates polystyrene plates, which sometimes pastors then burn because it's easier to get rid of it instead of dumping it somewhere just to burn it because no one has time to wash up. It's inconvenient to wash up. But when we teach people about what it means to love God and to love his creation, they have repented of their ways and have resolved not to use these disposable, disposables anymore. In fact, in some of our training programs, we've had pastors who have written letters of, of apologies to future generations as well for what they have done to this earth. A powerful exercise in not only acknowledging that this is God's world, but that loving our neighbors also includes showing care and consideration for future generations as well. How can we respond as people of God? Look south. You know, we look west all the time. We got the gospel from you. We sing your songs. We come to your seminaries and learn from you. And there's a desire to live like you. We want to live like you. We want to be you. But interestingly, many people in the west are discovering our indigenous practices and are following them. The ones that we rubbished and we thought that was, you know, not really good. And sometimes I wonder that perhaps the fact that we live so harmoniously with the rest of creation meant that we did not have to have specific teaching on creation care. You know, maybe my father's care for creation was an outworking of his faith, which influenced all aspects of his life and did not require a specific book or word study for justification. What can we learn from the church in the West in relation to creation care. 
Will the church in the West remain so divided by the politics of climate change that it fails to acknowledge and respond to the impact of climate change being felt now around the world? Will you look south? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. It has been a journey for me to learn what that means and what it means to love our neighbor in God's world. My understanding of God and his word draws me into an ever-growing awe of his creation and the depth of responsibility that God has given us as his image bearers. If I do not care for God's earth, I do not love God, nor do I love my neighbor. So what can we do about this? One of the first things that we can do is stop. Stop wasting time arguing about whether creation care matters or not, whether climate change is real or not. The impact of climate change is being felt everywhere. Stop thinking that the earth belongs to you and you are free to do whatever you want with it. It belongs to God. Treat the earth as sacred. Stop and reflect on whether your understanding of God affects every aspect of your life here on this earth. And what can we start doing? Start by acknowledging that the resources on this earth are for everyone to share. There is only one earth and not five. Start speaking up. Loving our neighbors and living a life that looks after the earth is not a political opinion. It is our faith. Educate and encourage others by using your voice. Start listening to people from across the world whose forests are dry, whose air is polluted, and whose rivers are choked as a result of having to manufacture products to feed our consumerist lifestyle. In 2017, the snowy owl was categorized as a vulnerable species by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Should it matter to us? God created all living beings. The earth belongs to God. We are commanded to love God and to love our neighbors. Why should it not matter to us? Thank you for listening to my journey. And I pray God would challenge all of us to continue to move in our journeys, to learn, to relearn, to unlearn, and perhaps even to change our minds. Thank you. Should use this. Oh, okay. I just want to thank both of you, Cookie uh, and Ruth, for what you've shared, uh, your insights. You've given us a lot to ponder this morning. Um, you both have called us to look, um, to look beyond our everyday, to listen um, in ways that will deepen and transform our relationship with Christ. And we have so many cultural challenges. I appreciate um, um, how we just need to continue to consider and reflect and learn from one another. Um, things that hinder our abilities to fully understand and um, the surroundings of where we live and our creation, creation around us. Um, as you both have said, we need to redefine um, and deepen our understanding of who God is um, the interconnectedness of all of creation and our um, care for that grace of creation from God and what that looks like to do that in the context of loving our neighbors. So thank you for that. Um, I still remember the first time I saw my first snowy owl. Um, it was a breathtaking moment in New England. and. Um, I was helping with an ornithology course, and I still remember uh, the professor saying, there it is, and we all were like, there it is. And um, I went and grabbed John's book, and 
uh, this is just a, a really good read. I encourage you to take a peek at this. But here's a little piece about the snowy owl. So we must learn to imitate the owls, which swivel their heads right round. For then we can perform our essential spiritual contortion, looking back to Christ's death and resurrection with enormous gratitude and looking on to his return with eager expectation. This is the only right way in which to be a Mr. or a Ms. facing both ways, and he refers back to Pilgrim's Progress. And I appreciate um, your call, uh, both of you, to, to look back, to learn, uh, to be present, uh, to look forward. Um, as we think about this issue, um, do we even know where to find these amazing creatures? Do we know where to find a snowy owl? That's a great question. Um, and what can we learn from these organisms? I also appreciate your call, the call from both of you for spiritual transformation um, and the call to action and justice. And these cannot be separated. We often separate them. Um, and we do need the Spirit to help us with this. So let's, um, I have several questions, but let's just get started and see how this goes. Um, as you, you both have mentioned, and, and I think of uh, my students and my interactions with them and my own upbringing, more and more of us have grown up in urban places. So we haven't had people like John Stott, like your father, like my father, my mother, teaching us teaching us and modeling and showing us these things that um, they intuitively just live out. Um, this model of love for and connection with creation. So how might you encourage those of us that are more urbanish, I guess, um, to cultivate uh, this deeper concern for God's creation? What spiritual practices or disciplines or how might you encourage for example, a student that says, I, I, I know what you're talking about, but I don't know how to um, cultivate that way of, of knowing and believing in my life. I'm not sure. Is this one on? Oh, this one's on. So I'll give this one back to you guys. Yeah, I think most of us. Um, I grew up in Buenos Aires, um, 14 million people. Um, but I think that's where what, what's tested is our capacity to see, because even in Buenos Aires, um, a, a jungle of cement, there are um, there's life other than human life. There are plants breaking their way through the cement. There are um, birds, although this recent study is saying that even your backyard birds in this country and North America are disappearing. So you're hearing far less. Um, we are so privileged at Casado because there are trees. So, so, but, but it is, some of it is identifying what's there, just asking for eyes to see and to, and to nourish that capacity of awareness. Um, and, but then there's also the, the, I think there's this spiritual attitude to recognize ourselves as dependent on the rest of creation. It's Terry LeBlanc, our friend from um, Canada uh, First Nations, that says, Ruth, he told me one time, when, when did you give more to creation, to the rest of creation, than it gave to you? I mean, our bodies themselves are composed of water. Um, what, what, and we, we're de absolutely dependent. So some of it is just a, a frame of mind of not taking it for granted, of being aware and celebrating and expressing gratitude. Um, and, and then saying, what of the way we are living is inhibiting this life from flourishing, both locally and globally? Um, what of the way we're living is not allowing that to continue developing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the first response would be, we all need to be convinced from scripture, first of all, 
um, of who the, uh, who the creator is and, and what we are called to do. And I think once you have that conviction, then it's easier to see. Because um, like I live with my brother's family and he's got three boys, aged 12 to 19. And they learn about environmental protection from a secular point of view, from school, from university, you know, do this, do that, uh, otherwise it's bad. And, and that can be one response, but that is not a whole response. It's not a wholesome response. So I think the first way that we can, what we need to do is to learn from scripture and to understand who God is, his creation. And we are just one part of that creation. Although the crown of creation, we are part of that. And then you begin to perceive things in a different way. And the second is what, what you know, Ruth and has, has been talking about this morning, is to look. You know, although you may not have beautiful things to look at in a concrete jungle, I live in Delhi, my goodness. You know, you wouldn't <laughs> want to come there because we're like choking to death over there with pollution. But there are trees. And I remember the first time I properly looked at a tree, I noticed that even in a single branch, there were so many different colors of green. And that's what you know, I teach other people as well. Just look at one single tree and you can see God's creativity in that and appreciate God in that, in just the colors of the green. You know, it's green here, but there's just one shade of green. You know, th just the creativity of God can be reflected in such simple things. Looking at the sky, the sky you can see everywhere. Well, if it's not that polluted, <laughs> sometimes we can't see the sky in Delhi. But when you can see, you can appreciate. So I've got my 16-year-old nephew who just looks at the sky and he goes, wow. So that is really important. And, I, and, and I'll share another uh, one more thing is, you know, when we were doing this training on creation care with, with church leaders, there was one non-Christian person who was there with us. And she told me, you know, the problem nowadays is everyone lives in high-rise apartments, you know, inside your own little uh, apartment, yes, in your own little cubicle. Children play with plastic toys or they're in front of a screen nowadays. And no one has connection to the earth anymore. You don't actually touch earth, mud, you know, that earth. We think it's dirty. You know, I, I don't know about you, but when, you know, a lot of uh, people growing up, it's like, don't touch it, that's dirty. But it's not dirty. Well, it's dirty in many places and toxic in many others. But how do we then get young people to get in touch, you know, and, and, and touch earth. Those things are really, re really important for us to connect and to enjoy. And once you enjoy creation and see the beauty of the rest of creation, you will begin to learn to appreciate and take care of it. And it should lead you into a pre an appreciation of the maker. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the ultimate goal. Amen. Thank you. Um, out on our campus, there's the, the sign, For Christ in His Kingdom. And oftentimes our students will say, well, um, I'm, I'm not a biology major, and you've touched this somewhat, but, uh, and you mentioned this uh, in your talk a bit, uh, Cookie, but students will say, well, um, that's not my call. And how would you continue to elaborate on explaining that care for creation is a call for all of us? Because some students will say, well, um, you know, I'm going into this or the that major. I'm not a biology major. I don't have time to care. Um, and your response would be? Well, I studied political science. Nothing to do with birds, nothing to do with animals or trees or anything of that sort. But I think if you read the same Bible as I do, then it's very clear. So it's, you know, uh, which is what I tell in training sessions as well. You know, we... If, if it's the same Bible, then it's very clear. God created everything. He delighted in it. And he has given us that responsibility to take care of God's creation. So it's not like, mm, I opt out of this God, sorry. It's the first mission that was ever given to human beings. And so I don't think there's a, you know, I'm not studying that, so I'll opt out of it. It's, it there is no opt out of you know, enjoying God's creation, the rest of God's creation, and, uh, uh, you know, stewardship of God's creation. Right. One issue, though, I think, is perhaps you don't read the same Bible we read. Um, I have a friend uh, who grew up, a Dutch-American, who has witnesses to how he came to a whole new understanding of his calling in the world and the calling of the church when he read his Bible in Spanish. 
part of that is because translators have a lot of power <laughs> in the version of the Bible we receive. And the fact is that many, many, many places where your Bibles in English say righteousness, Bibles in many of the Roman back, Latin background languages say justice. And our understanding of justice then, um, not as a punitive, just retributive thing, but as something that has to do with right relations, with restoring the way things should be. And that has a huge implication in how we live in the rest in the relation to the whole of creation, not just to human animals, to all of creation. And, and so I think that is another thing John Stott taught us is to really go into scripture, as Kuki was saying, and read with new eyes. Say, what is our calling? Because the concept of righteousness so often is just about me and God and me being a moral, proper person and at least looking good like I'm doing the right things. That's righteous. Justice opens up a whole new world of relationships. If we are going to live justly, if we're going to pursue justice in the world, there are going to be implications in all our relationships with human animals, with God, our creator, but also with the rest of the created order. And so there, there is a deeper call that sometimes we're blinded to. That's wonderful. Oftentimes when we hear the word justice, we think about humans helping others. But again, your emphasis, both of you are reminding us that that word is across the board and all of creation. You, you both mentioned greed quite a bit <laughs> in places of your talk this morning. Um, and as you spoke, I thought that greed is a weed in the garden of our hearts that needs to be uprooted. So how might you encourage us, help us, teach us to um, uproot that um, ask God for help to uproot that and change that in our American lives, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I think it is, it is the poison that, that colors so much of our attitude towards everything. And, and um, the fact that, that our, our imagination is so captive to defining ourselves based on what we have, what we can appear to have, the image is, is so important. I mean, even, even something like coming here, okay, what are you gonna put on? How are you gonna dress? Um, I've come to, to have a bit of a uniform. I have like three things I speak in all the time. So if you look at YouTubes, you'll see the same three things. <laughs> because, because, yes, because we put so much time into, into into such superficial things. And if we relate to people for whom that is not even a possibility, if we're exposed to real need, it helps us become aware of how much we are determined by greed and by this idea that you need to appear, you need to, you need to um, uh, present an image and sell even yourself not only buy and sell things, people are bought and sold, as Cookie was talking about traffic, but also our attitudes towards others can be so consumerist. Um, we, 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 and, our, and our life becomes just um, uh, a business endeavor. I give, you give, an interactive kind of you know, exchange. And so how do we uproot that at the heart? Um, humble ourselves before God, recognize our createdness, how we are just, basically we came from dirt, we go to dirt, there's not a whole lot that we can really fake um, before our creator. We're exposed, we're naked before God. Um, and then how, how do we engage with others in a way that is not mediated by stuff, by this that the world tells us is so preeminently important. Um, I mean, there's lots. It's hard to think of so many things just on the spot. 
<laughs> uh, yes, I mean, it's easy to accuse somebody else of being greedy without realizing your own <laughs> greediness. And I think human nature, you know, we're all uh, pretty, you know, um, greedy people. But what I, what I, it has to be intentional. You have to intentionally practice being less greedy. And one thing that I say uh, often is, just because I can, I should not. You know, just because I can afford something doesn't mean I should. And I think we need to remind ourselves again and again. You know, you may have lots of money, you may have lots of food, but just because you do, does it mean that you, you should just spend it or eat as much as you want or, or do whatever you want? Again, the whole consciousness, you know, at the base is your faith that matters. Who, how do you understand God really matters? And from there, even things like greed, you know, talking about what to wear, I wrote to Laura and I, Laura Atkinson and said, what is the dress code? But I, and I also wrote to her saying that whatever dress code you say, I'll probably be wearing the same thing. Um, because um, <laughs> like Ruth says, I, I don't have a huge array of clothes, which doesn't make me any better than anyone else. But just to, what I'm saying is, you know, we need to be intentional. We need to think through things. Um, when I first came to the West from India, I was shocked. And I was telling Laura Yoder about that. You have gas that, come, that came in pipes, and it was you know, unlimited. And you know, we went to fill uh, the car with, what do you call gas here, petrol. And it was like, fill her up, you know? Whereas back home, it was like, okay, how much money do we have? And we're going to fill, we're going to just, just buy 10 liters. I don't know how that translates into gallons, but you, know, you get it. You know, just how much we need. And so I think we need to try and live like that, knowing that it's, the earth is not endless and limitless. There is a limit to everything. And how do I live within that limit? And also realizing that that actually is honoring to God as well. Just because you, own, uh, you earn buckets of money doesn't mean you spend buckets and do what you want to do with it. You know, there could be much better use of what you have. In God's economy, there is enough for everybody. But the problem is that some of us have too much. And, uh, and you know, you've heard the saying that, you know, there's, in this world, there's enough for everyone's need, but not for anyone's, everyone's greed. So five Earths, for all of us, we all want to live like Americans. You know, I'll honestly tell you that. In India, we all want to live like you all. But if we all live like that, this planet would crash. So I think we all need, some of us need to come down a, a few notches down so that the others can be lifted up as well. And that's not what the world wants. We need to remember that's not what the world wants. And that's what the world is going to teach us to stay away from because we want a better life, a better car, a faster car, a bigger house, everything bigger and better. But we have to be intentional in the choices that we make. And it's hard. It's hard, especially when everyone else is doing that. There's a, there's a movement that is becoming more and more prominent around the world. It began in Latin America, but also in Eastern Europe, and it's called the degrowth movement. And it's um, an attempt, and these are not Christians. I wish it had been Christians that initiated it. But it's saying they're questioning this, this idea that more, 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 always more, it's always better. And saying there are limits. And there is such a thing as enough. Um, Schumacher says this, and small is beautiful. There is such a thing as enough. And there is such a thing as too much. And our society doesn't believe that. We always need more. And so what does it do to look at scripture and look at Jesus teaching about the birds even? John talked about this. That they don't, you know, when he talks in the Sermon on the Mount about the birds, and we think, oh, you know, that's just kind of old rural stuff. But, but maybe not. Maybe it's a word for us today. And, and what does it mean to live? And again, I don't think anybody, any one of us, is capable of living this out individually. Because the current is so powerful that uh, the expectations are just blasted at us from all media about what the ideal life is, what it looks to be successful in the world with your career, with your family, with everything has to look like this. And, and so we need one another 
to inspire, to nourish, to sustain, to provoke, to challenge us, to recognize that we can live with less, that more is less, like the old Mennonite cookbook, more with less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I do have that cookbook, and I love it. It's falling apart, but the recipes are amazing, and less is more. It really, really is. Um, just want to thank you both so much for what you've shared and how you've challenged us. Let's uh, thank our speakers. Thank you.